So welcome to um, this, this lunchtime seminar at the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. My name's David Feldman. I'm the, the director of the Institute. Um, and our speaker today, I'm delighted to introduce, is Jorai Linenberg. Yorai is an honorary research fellow here at the Institute, and he joined us here having, having completed his PhD at the London School of Economics. His book, Jewish Soldiers in Nazi Captivity, was published towards the end of last year by Oxford University Press, and that is based on his PhD dissertation and deals with the experience of American and British Jewish prisoners of war in German, in German captivity during the Second World War. And today he'll be speaking to us on a related and absolutely fascinating theme. He'll be speaking to the title, Jewish Soldiers Nazi captors, what was it like to be a Jewish POW in a Nazi camp? You're right, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, David. Let me just share my uh, screen here. Just a second. Oops. Here we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining the seminar. Today I'll discuss, as David said, the experience Jewish POWs from Western armies had in Nazi POW camps. What was it like to be held captive by a nation which was so obsessed with implementing the final solution for the Jewish question? Paul Fisher, whose POW card you can see here, was one of those Jewish POWs, prisoners of war. He was born in 1908 in Budapest. He went to school there. Then he continued on to study economics in university. However, in 1933, due to the anti-Semitism, he decided to immigrate to Palestine, then under a British mandate. Two years later, he married his wife, Tova. And in 1940, their son, Yuda, who was kind enough to share with us this uh, photo of the POW card of his father, was born. When World War II broke, uh, Paul volunteered for the British Army and was placed together with uh, several thousand Palestinian Jews in the pioneer companies of the Royal Engineering Corps. In March 1941, we have the British Army units, including some pioneer companies, sent to the Balkans, an unsuccessful attempt to stop the German invasion. Facing defeat, some of these British units were able to be evacuated, but the rest had to surrender on the 29th of April, 1941. Among them were 1,500 Palestinian Jews. Paul was captured, but was immediately able to escape and managed to make his way with the help of local fishermen to Crete. A month later, he was captured again and spent the rest of the war as a prisoner in Germany. He was one Jewish prisoner of war out of an estimated 100,000 plus Jews from Western armies who, kept, who were kept in Nazi captivity. In this presentation, I want to focus mainly on the experience these POWs had uh, during their capture, and then during the time in the Stalags, which is the main base camp, and the labor detachments, which were smaller camps, where the majority of the POWs actually spent their captivity period working in factories, in mines, in agriculture, I want to be clear uh, first, the presentation deals with Jewish prisoners of war from Western armies. The war in the East against the Soviet Union was defined by Hitler as a war between ideologies, so a war of extermination. And this resulted what is known as the criminal orders, one of which was the Commissar Order, which instructed uh, the Wehrmacht to murder Soviet commissars and Soviet Jewish prisoners of war almost immediately after they were captured. The Polish Jewish POWs were in general mistreated, but not executed. This actually happened later. Uh, majority of the Polish POWs, Jews and non-Jews, were released 
1940-1941, the Jews among them were sent to uh, uh, the ghettos, obviously, and later throughout the war to extermination camps. And this is what makes the case of Jewish prisoners of war from Western countries, Britain, US, France, Yugoslavia even, so unique. I mean, think about it. The civilian brothers throughout Europe, Jewish prisoners of war from the Soviet Union were being worked to death, tortured, murdered, and in parallel, we have tens of thousands of Jews being treated in most cases in the same way as the non-Jewish comrades had been treated and in adherence with the 1929 Geneva Convention. Now, the scale of the Holocaust wasn't known to the Jewish uh, prisons of war, as was the case for the rest of the world, uh, but they were most likely aware of Germany's German general discrimination uh, against the Jews and their mistreatment and probably heard about cases of murder of Jewish civilians around Europe. So the purpose of this presentation is to give you a glimpse into what it, what it was like to be a Jewish POW in a Nazi POW camp. Starting with the numbers, in total there were approximately 200,000 Jewish soldiers uh, captured by Germany and its European allies during the war. The majority of them were Soviet, uh, most of whom didn't survive, obviously. They were Polish and French, uh, but there are also several thousand Jewish prisoners of war from other allied armies from Western countries and from Yugoslavia. Uh, my research focused mainly on the experience of uh, Jewish POWs from the US and Britain. In total, uh, it's estimated there were about 2,200 British Jewish POWs we mentioned uh, the Palestinian Jews who were 1,500 among them that we mentioned earlier. Uh, interestingly, 70% of the Palestinian Jews, including Paul Fisher, who you saw his POW card earlier, there were immigrants from uh, who fled Europe as a result of anti-Semitism before the war. The other 700 were British Jews who like their uh, 2,500 American Jewish prisoners of war fought in all branches of their armies. So let's start with the moment of capture. It was impossible to shut out the thoughts of being a Jew about to become a prisoner of war in Nazi Germany. This is how Norman Rubinstein, a British Jewish soldier, described his feelings when he realized he was about to become a POW of the German Reich. Another one, Second Lieutenant Louis Lovsky, he was an American Jewish B-24 navigator, uh, described the dilemma many Jewish soldiers had when the realization that they are about to become prisoners of the Germans dawned on them. The religion, you need to remember, was imprinted on the soldiers' identification tab. So, tab. so the, the British Jews has J for Jewish, the American had H for Hebrew. And the question was, should they keep their identification disks or should they throw them, throw them away? Should they expose themselves to their captors as Jews? I mean, this dilemma became even more pressing, obviously, as the war progressed and their reports about the extent of the murder of the Jews became even more frequent. Now, the decision to hide one's Jewish identity or change a name when enlisting, this might not have been a simple decision, but still, in these early stages, the consequences were negligible. But those who decided to register their real identity, the realization that marking on their disk might mean more than just a proper way to receive a burial, uh, it dawned on them together with the realization that they were about to be taken prisoner by an enemy that viewed them as a race of untermenschen, subhumans. Until now, it was a theoretical risk. Now it become a real one with maybe life or death consequences. It might mean that uh, if they throw their disk, they might be considered a spy with no identification uh, uh, papers, that the family wouldn't be informed about their capture. For some, throwing their identification disk is like throwing away part of their identity, their history, their culture. And there was always the question lingering in the back of their minds, what would their non-Jewish comrades think about them or even do? There had been, in fact, discussions in, the, uh, in Britain following the Polish campaign about removing the religion denomination altogether from the disc, and this, it even reached the British Parliament, but eventually a decision was made to keep it. 
And I have no doubt that this contributed to the decision of many Jewish uh, draftees to register under a different religion or even to declare themselves as atheists. We also have the Palestinian Jews who uh, they could not, in fact, they would not hide their identity. Their commanders made a conscious decision to go into captivities as Jews. The vast majority uh, followed. Uh, there were some who managed to escape and a very small minority who uh, decided to commit suicide instead of becoming prisoners of the Germans. Once arriving in the camp, the first step was to register the new POW. Now, this is how Milton Feldman, a 19-year-old American infantry soldier, described his registration in the Stalag. As I got nearer to the desks, I could hear the questions being asked of the men in front of me. When it came to religion, lying seemed the safe thing to do. I hadn't heard any other POW admit to being Jewish, but I didn't care. In my mind, I said, F you. I was young, angry, and by any measure, stupid. I answered, Jewish. As we saw with the POW card at the beginning of the presentation, the religion was just one item the, the Germans, uh, of information the Germans had to collect. <clears throat> but the orders to identify and segregate prisoners according to nationality and race, in the Jewish case, the religion, were in fact specified in the Geneva Convention. Uh, they were included in the Commandant's Manual, which was published before the war. However, unlike the case of Polish and French POWs, the implementation in the case of British and American ones did not seem to be very strict. We have an example of a, a speech, an introductory speech by one commandant uh, who gave it to the newly arrived group of British POWs who had just been captured in France. He ordered all Jewish POWs to step forward, but only one obeyed. And when another Jewish POW tried to join, he was held down by two of his non-Jewish comrades. The Germans didn't make any attempt to identify others. We have another testimony describing a more determined attempt to identify Jews. <clears throat> Since the Germans were not satisfied with the number of Jewish uh, prisoners who set forward, we were then ordered to drop our trousers and lift our shirts, were looked at, and anyone seemed to be circumcised were taken away. This is actually a rare example uh, of such a method for identifying Jews since this uh, circumcision test scenes, which were com so common in the East in the following year, rarely occurred in the West. This is actually, I think, one of two examples that I was able to find in my, uh, my research. Once in the camp, this is how another Jewish POW, Leonard Vinograd, American Jewish navigator, described the feeling of being a Jewish POW in the German POW camp. We had hunger. We had bombing by our own planes. Fleas now were in command and rats were everywhere. And with it all, there was the ever-present horror of being a Jew in prison in Germany. And it all added up to a hopeless situation. However, despite this feeling, it was very strange, but the captivity period of Jewish POWs from Western Army was in general not that different from that of the non-Jewish comrades. If they were in the base camp, the Stalag, they usually had access to education activities, sport activities. In the labor detachment, where most of the prisoners spent their captivity period, they usually worked like the other six or six and a half days a week. Some actually considered the labor detachment a better place to, to be for the simple reason that it helped them get over the boredom of Stalag life. And some actually wanted to go to labor detachment because they found it a, a, an easier place to escape from. But let's get it right. This is not to say that the POW's life for Jews and non-Jews alike were by any means enjoyable, far from it. The meager food rations, uh, supplemented, supplemented every now and then by Red Cross parcels, constant risk of being shot by a, a trigger-happy guard, the sadism of some of the guards, hard work, almost slave labor-like in some of the labor detachment, all those created an environment which was far from pleasant. But obviously for the Jews among them, they always had this added uncertainty of being a Jewish POW in a country which was obsessed with exterminating their race. 
1929 Geneva Convention was the framework used by the German POW office, which was part of the German Army High Command for governing the camps where non-Soviet POWs were held. We need to remember the Soviet prisoners of war had no protection. The Geneva Convention did not protect them at all. In addition, throughout the war, this POW office issued thousands of instructions and guidelines and orders to uh, govern and, and manage the lives of the POWs. The main ones were about 1,200 were gathered in biweekly letters that were sent to the commandants. Now, going through them, I was able to find only eight which mentioned Jewish POWs specifically, and only one issued as late as December 1944, entitled uh, uh, Treatment of Jewish POWs, made any reference to how they should be treated. And interestingly, it says that their treatment should be in exactly the same way as prisoners of war from the same army were being treated. In other words, no discrimination against Jewish POWs was allowed. We need to remember that in parallel, outside the camps, policies against Jewish civilians in Europe escalated throughout the war from segregation to deportation, extermination, obviously the Holocaust. We also had policies against non-Soviet prisoners of war going through their own radicalization process. We had the commando order who specifically prohibited taking allied commander soldier alive after uh, battles. Uh, we have the Kugel Erlass, which meant that escaping POWs who were caught were sent directly to the concentration camp and not to uh, back to the POW camp. We have lynching of allied air, air crews, which was encouraged by the authorities. And obviously we have the murder of the Sagan escapees, the great escape. Eventually in 1944, towards the end of the year, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, took over responsibility for prisoners of war from the Wehrmacht. However, and this is another strange thing, the impact of the, all these orders and policies or, uh, on the lives of the POWs inside the camp was quite limited. You see, we have an SS general being in charge of the POW office. We have the Reich security main office demanding that Jewish POWs would be handed over to them and we know what would, that, what would happen then? We have local party functionaries, Nazi functionaries demanding, uh, uh, complaining that prisoners of war in general are being treated too well. But in the, on the other hand, we have the POW camp providing some sort of an unintended reverse protection for these POWs inside the camp from all those external events. Uh, in my opinion, this was probably helped by the fact that the majority of the guard battalions, the guard and also the commandant, were men of different age and health profile uh, to those, the combatant soldier, the, the fighting soldier, possibly with different motivations as well. Their frame of reference was not the battle with all its brutalities, but the mundane day-to-day -day life of POW camp, which was governed by the Geneva Convention. So in most cases, Wehrmacht discipline proved to be stronger than Nazi ideology. Not always, but in most cases. Again, this doesn't mean that cases of, of discrimination and uh, mistreatment of Jewish POWs did not occur. The discipline of the Wehrmacht soldier guarding the prisons of war did not always guarantee that. But in most cases, when this happened, complaints were filed with the, sometimes the Red Cross and even investigations were conducted where we had discrimination and mistreatment, sometimes even murder due to anti-Semitism. It was in most cases either a result of interaction of the POWs with the German civilians working side by side with, the, with them in mines or in, in factories. And these civilians attempted to treat the POWs in the same way the Jewish civilians had been treated. Other cases, uh, it was the individual commandant or guards who simply uh, held anti-Semitic views and uh, acted upon them. As we can see from this testimony, there have been a few cases where individual uh, German cursed into Palestinian POWs, in this case, he's talking about Palestinian POWs, and called them damn Jews. And there were even a few blows given here and there. But in general, this was an individual initiative and not the policy dictated from above. We do have a few examples, obviously, of discriminations. 
uh, August 1942, as a reprisal for mistreatment of the German POWs in Palestine, that's where some of them were held, the German moves around 150 prisoners from one stalag to a penal camp in Poland. Uh, in an obvious act of discrimination, uh, more than half of these uh, POWs were Palestinian Jews. Another case, we have the Shackling crisis. I won't go into uh, the explanation what exactly it was, but it involved a year long reprisal from both sides. Thousands of POWs uh, were shackled. We have uh, 1,800 prisoners uh, in one stalag out of 10,000 uh, in total in that stalag. 1,800 were handcuffed. A hundred of them were Palestinian Jews, uh, which was a much higher share than their share of the camp population. Now the same miscalculation occurred in an Oflag, that's a camp for officer prisoners of war, where all the Jewish officers were shackled, even though the other officer were just selected in random. The life in labor detachment uh, wasn't easy, but the Jewish prisoners of war tried to make the most of it. So I'll give a couple of anecdotes here. Uh, in one of them, uh, we have the man of confidence. That's the MOC, the POW representative who was elected by the POWs and obviously had to be approved by the Germans. His name was Kallenborn. Uh, some of you may know him in later years, he's changed his name to Yosef Almogi, served as a member of the Israeli parliament and even cabinet. He was known throughout the district outside the camp as the gaulator of Oberschlesien, the, the leader of the district. His memoirs, uh, in his memoirs, we have Captain Julius Green, who was a Scottish Jewish prisoner, describing a visit he made to uh, Almogi's uh, camp as part of uh, uh, Green's duties as the Stalag dental officer. According to, uh, to Green, the camp was run as sort of a communal farm, like a kibbutz, and all proceeds from the camp's commercial, obviously black market activities uh, with the uh, civilian population around it, uh, went into a common pool. Apparently, uh, Almogi struck a deal with the commandant, according to which, in return for leaving the prisoners of war, the Jewish prisoners of war, to run their own affairs and delivering the daily quotas they were required to, the Germans would receive regular gifts of soap, tea, and chocolate from the POW's Red Cross parcels. Almogi's position was such that when Green, accompanied by his uh, German guard, was ready to make his way back to the camp on foot, Almogi wouldn't hear of it. He arranged for him to be taken by a horse-drawn carriage and forced the guard to sit next to the coachman instead of in the back, demanding to know what makes you think you're entitled to sit beside a British officer. I mean, can you imagine that? A Jewish prisoner of war tells off and orders around a German soldier. Now, when it came to interaction with the local civilian, we have the example of Paul Weiner. It's another anecdote. He was an Austrian-born Jew who migrated to immigrated to Palestine. He was placed to, to, to sent to work on a farm with a, a group of uh, German-speaking Jews, Jewish POWs. Uh, one day, the owner of the farm appeared, uh, sent the guards away, and demanded to know why the prisoners of war did not tell him that they were Jewish. The prisoners obviously was a bit scared, confused. Uh, without waiting for an answer, however, he told them that he was from Vienna, where his best friend, a Jewish lawyer, was made to strut the, the streets of Vienna with a toothbrush before being kicked to death. He then told the confused POWs that from then on, he would take care of all their needs. In his memoir, Weiner described the, next, the following three years mostly as an uninventful, even pleasant period. The POWs had sufficient food, were usually treated with respect by their guards, and developed close, sometimes amorous relations with the German women from the nearby village. The several unavoidable pregnancies that resulted were always blamed on a soldier on leave. Uh, I don't want you to get the impression that uh, this was the life. These are just two anecdotes that I, I, I thought would be useful to share with you. But uh, obviously, there were lots of aspects of the POW life which were specific to Jewish POWs. And I, I will go over them in the next few slides. The first one was this segregation, which I mentioned, of uh, Jews from non-Jews in the POW camp. Uh, the Geneva Convention allowed 
uh, actually encourage the segregation of POW by uh, nationality and race. But for the drafters, it was clear that race at that time meant skin color. Uh, obviously, they didn't ma make any attempt to clarify it. Uh, the Germans had a different interpretation, obviously, and they used this clause as justification for segregating the Jews from non-Jews. They put them in separate barracks in the same camp, although in most cases they did not suffer any discrimination. Now, the case of American and British Jewish POWs was different. They were almost never segregated. Uh, this probably had to do with the decentralized nature of the POW uh, organization, which uh, allowed the commandant to use uh, common sense. Um, most of them were from, again, older generation, maybe holding the spirit of uh, the old German army that required uh, respect for your enemies. But uh, in my opinion, it was mainly the objections of the uh, MOCs, the men of confidence, which you didn't see in other cases of the French Jews or the Yugoslavian Jews uh, that contributed to that. So we have several cases where commandants demanded at the roll call that the Jewish POWs identify themselves by taking a step forward. And in response, the whole parade took a step, a step forward together. One case, Roddy Edmonds, a non-Jewish prisoner, you can see him in this photo. He was the man of confidence in Stalag 9A near Ziegenheim. He was, uh, after being threatened with the gun by the commandant for refusing to order the Jews in, in the parade of 2000 American POWs, he refused to order them to step forward. And then he told the commandant, we are all Jews. If you shoot me, you'll have to shoot everyone. The commandant had to walk away empty handed. For his bravery, Edmund was recognized in 2015 by Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. I'm sure most of you know this is a commendation given to non-Jews for risking their lives in order to rescue Jews <clears throat> during the Holocaust. Now, when it came to religious activities, we need to remember that most Jews in America uh, and Britain, they were not religious. Uh, regardless of that, uh, uh, the religious activities were one way where the Jewish POWs, uh, uh, they used it to maintain their spirit in captivity. Celebration of Jewish holidays, sometimes in secret, in secret it was just another component uh, to strengthen their Jewish identity. In 1942, December 42, the height of the shackling crisis, the Palestinian Jewish POWs in, in one style like, had the nerve to, uh, to ask for permission through the Red Cross to celebrate Hanukkah. The permission was granted and they had to release a few prisoners from the shackles, but then they prepared the big ceremony they lit the ceremonial Hanukkah and performed a Jewish themed theater show in front of hundreds of POWs, Jews, non-Jews alike. At some point, several German officers and guards even joined the audience. You can see in the bottom photo, this is the photo of the Jewish, the Hanukkah celebration, some of the prisoners still wearing the costumes from, from the theater show. The top photo, uh, you can see the celebration of the Rosh Hashanah in 1944, the Jewish uh, New Year. When it came to funerals, actually this discrepancy between the German anti-Semitic policies and the respect that Wehrmacht paid to non-Soviet Jewish Untermenschen who died in captivity was extremely confusing. Uh, one of these events, you have the, uh, the coffin of uh, Sergeant Itzhak Elkin. He was a Jewish POW, died of cancer. The, the coffin was wrapped in the British flag and the flag with the Star of David was in front of the coffin, you have two German soldiers marching with a, a wreath, and in the center of it was the swastika sign. The coffin was followed by a guard of honor, nine armed Wehrmacht soldiers fired an honor volley after the body was laid to grave. Then one of the Jewish prisoners said a prayer in Hebrew. Now, this process didn't always uh, happen, uh, but the religious symbol, the Jewish religious symbol, the sighting of Jewish prayer was always part of such funeral. And the Wehrmacht, sometimes grudgingly, was required to show respect to these POWs who the German state considered to be their mortal racial enemies. Now, the Wehrmacht issued this funeral order related to Jews in 1941, July 1941. This coincided with the beginning of the mass murder phase of the Holocaust. And we shouldn't underestimate this, uh, this uh, event. 
I mean, think about it. You have the Soviet Jewish POWs, you have the uh, civilian Jews around Europe all being executed, worked to death, and gassed. You have their bodies either burned or dumped in unmarked mass grave. And the Wehrmacht, on the other hand, ordered to treat non-Soviet Jewish prisoners who died in captivity as honorable foes, even that even in their death still deserved its respect. When we talk about encounters that the POWs had with the Holocaust victims, uh, I think nowhere the transnational nature of Jewish identity was more apparent than in these cases. Uh, at first, the POWs refused to believe the rumors, but uh, they quickly, their re realization began to sink for some of them who had encountered these victims working side by side with them. So one of them said, when told about the gas chambers, most of us flatly refused to believe it. Even knowing the Germans as we did, we found the story simply too horrible to believe. Another one describes the Jewish inmates as skeletal men in striped shirts with stars of David stitched on their arms and Juden marked across their back. In one case, we, have, uh, we had several Palestinian Jewish POWs who found themselves working side by side with Jewish inmates from a concentration camp. They obviously tried to pass them food, but the SA guard started to hit one of the inmates with his rifle, with his rifle uh, and the Jewish POW intervened and pushed the guard away, causing the rest of the SA guard to pull out their weapons. Uh, the, to calm the situation, the POW uh, MOC, the Men of Confidence, proposed to the commandant to reach an agreement with the SA commander, according to which, in return for again generous gifts from the POWs of co coffee and chocolate and cigarettes, the incidents would be silent. But in addition, 30 Jewish inmates would be allowed into the camp every day to be properly fed and medically examined. Then the whole camp gathered donations of food, soap, cigarettes from their own daily quota and passed them on to the Jewish inmate. They were in such bad physical shape that the British doctor treated them, asked the men of confidence for his opinion regarding mercy killing. The MOC flatly rejected it. This arrangement ended after a few weeks when the Jewish inmates disappeared. They probably were sent to concentration, to exam examination camps. Just, uh, they were not protected by the, like the POW, they were not protected by the Geneva Convention. And some of the Jewish POWs, who only a few years earlier had emigrated from the same countries from which these uh, slave labor friend, uh, brothers came, must have felt fortunate because in not so different circumstances, it could have been them. And now we come to the final point, why? Why were these tens of thousands of Jews kept alive while their civilian brothers were murdered? There are several explanations in the literature for this phenomenon. However, in my opinion, these explanations are, are only partial. For example, the fear of reprisal against German prisoners of war does not explain the treatment of Jewish POWs from countries without German captives, such as France and Yugoslavia. The national conservative value system, which required all armies and the German army as well, to treat its enemies in an honorable manner was obviously nowhere to be found uh, with the atrocities on the Eastern Front. And there was also the argument that there were two types of war, the Eastern, the East Front and the West Front. But we know that East Front type atrocities were becoming more and more common in the West as the war progressed. So in my opinion, at the highest level, I think it was the POW office, again, part of the, the high German high command, which was probably the main reason for the survival of these non-Soviet Jewish prisoners. The POW office was a different animal, so to speak, in that it did not, uh, to use the term, work towards the fear. Other organization in the Reich, uh, without the need for specific order, tried to anticipate Hitler's wishes the spirit of the leader, so to speak, and act accordingly. It wasn't the case with the POW office. It acted only when it received specific order. And one example is the case of the Spanish Republican prisoners. This, I'm sure maybe most of you don't know, these were fugitives from Franco Spain. After the Civil War, they escaped to France. They joined the French army and they became captives in, uh, of Germany. 
Now, in theory, they were supposed to be protected by the Geneva Convention, but in practice, they were picked one by one from the POW camps and sent to concentration camp. 80% of them perished there. So I have no doubt that had an order been issued to send Jewish POWs to concentration camp, it would have been followed to the letter. But since no such order arrived, the POW office did not work towards the Fuhrer. This was the main reason, in my opinion, the Jewish POWs from Western Army were the most protected Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yorai, for an absolutely fascinating paper. Um, we have time for questions and discussion, about 25 minutes. So please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask, ask, ask a question um, or make a comment. Um, let me just start uh, your eye by asking you um, the explanation uh, that you gave at the end for the circumstances that you described is, is um, I think, it, it is persuasive, but in some ways it's it's persuasive up to a point because it left me curious about 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 uh, the conditions of the conditions, if you like. So why um, was the prisoner of war office distinctive in in not working towards the Führer? Um, uh, perhaps you could uh, could say something about that. Um, yes, the, this is obviously the question I asked myself when I came up with this explanation. And uh, I went through uh, the, to study some of the personalities of the people in the prison of war office. And uh, it turned out that uh, they were quite uh, strict in their interpretation. Uh, they felt they, uh, they, they had to, to hold uh, to, uh, the, the, to international law. Uh, to continue to adhere to the Geneva Convention, it even reached a point uh, uh, when they uh, when uh, Germany invaded uh, the Soviet Union that the head of the POW office at the time sent a letter after the Commissar order was issued and uh, Hitler claimed that uh, the Soviet Union is not protected by the Geneva Convention. The head of the uh, POW office reminded them that Article 82 of the convention demanded that anyone who signs the convention should adhere to the convention, even if the other uh, belligerent, in this case, the Soviet Union, is not uh, part of the convention. So these were people uh, of, of different, uh, I guess, different views, uh, still holding the, the perhaps the, uh, the values of the old German army, if, if there is such a thing, yes, but uh, um, and we know that some of them uh, objected to, to the way that the Soviet prisoners of war were treated. So uh, I went uh, step by step in the hierarchy um, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the German uh, authorities reach Hitler eventually. And since no order was find, found from him instructing uh, this uh, specific treatment of Jewish POWs, I came to the conclusion that it must have been the POW office who behaved differently to the rest. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we have a couple of hands raised. First of all, um, uh, someone um, um, whose initials, but not his name, it, it, is that RNW1, step forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, Neville Wiley from the University. Oh, of hi, Neville. Sterling, lovely to, to meet you and, and lovely to hear you again, your eye um, uh, and your paper. I, I had a, a question about the space occupied um, by the Jewish POWs and whether that had any effect on the way 
that they were treated. So we we typically look at at camps as as states of exception, um, where you know no law um, is applied, and you know obviously in, in in death camps and extermination camps and so forth, that is the the, the most extreme case. But in this case, um, you know these appear to be at least in the Western compounds, a certain space delineated by barbed wire and so forth, where those norms set out in the 1929 POW convention were being applied. Um, And I think you showed very persuasively how, for some reason, that normative pressure uh, affected um, the the treatment or mitigated the uh, uh, um, poor treatment of Jewish prisoners of war, but do we see a a, um, a difference in the labour battalions where that sense of protected space, if that's uh, if that's accurate to talk about that, um, is presumably a little bit weaker because you're you're you haven't got the same structures, uh, architecture, uh, and so forth in place. So is the experience different, or or is the evidence that you're dealing with so sort of thin that it's quite difficult to draw from the 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 anecdotes that you you've pulled from the literature on this. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, I think you're right. I mean, your last comment uh, that uh, the evidence is not. We don't have a lot of evidence of uh, what happened in labor detachment. We have a lot of evidence for the Palestinian Jews who were, uh, who chose. They were they didn't see it as segregation. They they chose to be in separate uh, labor detachment. And uh, every time, obviously, as, as you said, labor detachment uh, further away from the base camp and the commandant there were sort of the, 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 the king, the ruler of his domain and sometimes uh, behaved in that way. Uh, in the case of the Palestinian Jews, they were never afraid to, to uh, launch uh, uh, complaints with the protecting power or the Red Cross if this happened. Uh, some cases they even went on strikes on uh, hunger strikes, which is a loophole in the Geneva Convention that uh, maybe was closed in the, the recent update, but uh, they were allowed to do that. And since they, they couldn't uh, work, they were too weak. They uh, <clears throat> uh, they uh, uh, they were able to get their own way. In other uh, labor detachments where Jews were held, it was uh, non-Palestinian, so individual Jews, British Jews or American Jews, it was really up to the men of confidence to protect them or the, the bigger, the community of the prisoner of war. And in some example, they did. And uh, in some, in one case where a Jewish POW and British one uh, was threatened with the, being taken away by the Gestapo, all the, the other non-Jews POWs uh, gathered around him and said, you take him, you have to take all of us. But again, I, I'm not sure we can draw con- conclusion because these are just uh, specific anecdotes and uh, the body of evidence is not wide enough to, to make a concrete conclusion here. Thank you. Um, Dieter, Dieter Steiner, do you, you have your virtual hand in the air. Yeah, yes, I have. And, and, and I do hope that my questions make, make sense because I'm... I'm as curious as as David expressed his curiosity a minute ago. Um, it it is fascinating, interesting to 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 see that didn't Himmler and others know that there were tens of thousands of Jewish POWs in the POW camps, and if he knew, why didn't he intervene? Uh, we, we know that there were allied, Western allied uh, POWs in Monowitz working or in camps like like uh, uh, Blechhammer working. Uh, why not greater numbers, to, to put it very cautiously? And and then you talked about the identification disk and, and said in passing, and I'm convinced that there's more in your in in your in your book in your thesis on it in passing you said that uh, the brits british government decided uh, to leave religion on the identification disk so why is that and and maybe if i'm allowed a third question you said that at least not all jewish POWs knew about the holocaust have you found out what they con- 
in a very concrete way knew about how Jews were treated in Germany to, to in order to find out what they were specifically afraid of, if it wasn't the Holocaust. Was it being mistreated? Was it being shot or worked to death or whatever? But all in, it it fascinating topic and fascinating a paper you give. Thank, thank you, you for that. Uh, thank you. C can you just repeat your your first question? I I didn't write it down. It's it's about uh, why why didn't uh, Himmler intervene? Oh didn't sure he, yes. Didn't okay. He know? Yeah. So uh, interestingly, I, I found a letter from uh, one of the members of the POW office who claimed that uh, there were only. 3,000 Jewish POWs held by uh, Germany. Um, now, even if it's a typo, and it should be 30,000, and he said that most of them are, are French and, and Polish. Uh, now, even if he said 30,000, that's obviously way below the, the number, that uh, the, the real number. So I, I, I think that uh, there was, they did know that uh, there's no doubt that they knew about uh, the Jewish POWs. Uh, hence the order that was issued in, in December 1944 about how to treat them. Otherwise, why, why issue such order? Uh, Jewish POWs were uh, segregated in the French and Yugoslav and Polish uh, POW camps. Uh, they had several uh, separate barracks, they had several se uh, separate logistics, they needed uh, all that. So I have no doubt that he knew about it. Uh, if I had to make a, a, a guess, I would say that he kept it in his back of his mind, maybe as a sort of uh, a way to, to negotiate later with the allies if uh, push come to shove, you know, if he had to keep them in the back pocket as something to negotiate with. But um, on the other hand, I have no doubt that uh, had Germany won the war, they will all uh, be sent to concentration camps. That's a, that's a, a given, in my opinion. Uh, regarding the British decision, um, looking at the at the uh, protocols from the Parliament discussion, that the, the, no no reason was given why they decided to keep it eventually on the that keep the religion or the identification uh, this. I think it just had to do, I don't want to insult anyone, but uh, with the British mentality of uh, you know, stiff upper lick, just deal with it. That's uh, that's how we have to go to war. And also remember, it was just the beginning. It was in 1940, before uh, the horrors of the Holocaust uh, were known, before the, the horrors of the, the Eastern Fronts were known. So perhaps they decided it's a risk worth taking. Uh, regarding knowledge of the Holocaust, uh, again, I don't think anyone had, uh, even outside the camps, had knowledge of the, the scale of the Holocaust. Uh, but there's certainly the, the prisoners of war knew what was going on in terms of discrimination, in terms of mistreatment, in terms of uh, Jews being worked to death. I don't think they were aware that this is this thing that's happening throughout Europe and all Jews in Europe are being sent to, to these, uh, are suffering the same condition, but they were definitely aware. There are a few letters uh, by the Red Cross, which I saw that, that say that uh, the non-Jewish uh, POWs are very concerned about their fate because they, are, they were witnessing the fate of the civilian Jews around them. So I think this uh, tells us everything we need to know. Thank you, Yorai. Um, someone? Yes, uh, it's in Hebrew, I'm sorry. My name is Yosef Shaked. It's okay. uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, first, a small common, comment. Uh, the, at least the Palestinian POW cards were marked with the red sign, as you can see on Paul Fisher on the left side there is a mark so there was a, a constant fight between the wish of the Gestapo other to to kill them and uh, for the Wehrmacht or somebody to keep them in the camp so in the end they were staying alive but they were specifically marked with the red with the red sign on their card only which they are Jewish uh, my question is Uri and thank you for the lecture 
is how often were the contact between the Jewish POW from Palestine and the Jewish from the Auschwitz camp? I know there was some labor detachment, but how often was this uh, uh, this uh, contact that, as you described in the lecture, is, is one example of two? What are the yeah. evidence for this? Uh, there were, uh, this is just one uh, one example. There, there weren't many cases of that. In fact, there were there was a specific order, I think even issued by Hitler, that uh, 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 prisons of war should not work side by side with concentration camp inmates. Uh, it didn't mention Jews. It was all concentration camp inmates. Or, or they, actually, it didn't say concentration. It says, it says slave labor. So people from other countries, Poland, France, the uh, Prisons of war were not allowed to work side by side with them, so it did happen, but it wasn't it wasn't often. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We we have a number of questions in the in the chat, uh, Yorai. A num many of them go back to where we started. Uh, so, a uh, uh, Rachel a uh, uh, Rachel Seifert um would like you to say more about why it was that people in the prisoner of war office stuck to the letter of the geneva convention you've spoken to that to an extent but if you if you have more to say that would be helpful and there's a, a there's a follow up question from abigail who 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 relates to that saying was the german prisoner of war office the only case where this happened or have you come across other similar situations, other offices are following the Geneva Convention in a way that opposed the interpretation of the Fuhrer's wishes? Uh, well, I, I did analyze, I'll go to the last question, I did analyze the population of the camp commandants. And it turns out that their, uh, the rate of uh, uh, Nazi party membership of them was lower than the rate of the equivalent uh, officers and the equivalent level uh, in the um, in the German army as a whole. So uh, that's uh, one thing. Uh, another thing, when you, when you look at the dates they they joined the the, the Nazi Party, uh, most of them, the majority, joined after uh, Hitler came to power after 1933, which means that they were more of a opportunistic joining, and they they not really. I would like to think they did not really believe they were they're not real Nazis, so to speak. So um, that explained the, the case of the, the camp commandants, the leaders, the, the, the commanders of the POW camps. Um, again, go, going back to the POW office, I mean, uh, one of uh, its, its first, uh, the heads of the, which, which I, I read in, in, um, in other, uh, memoirs of people who, who met him, uh, they said he was strict to, to follow orders to, to the letter. Uh, he knew the Geneva Convention by heart. He knew every uh, clause in it. The copy he held on his desk was, was uh, almost teared, uh, almost uh, uh, the, the pages there were, were, were so uh, used that he could hardly uh, uh, read it anymore. And in one case, uh, this uh, Red Cross representative drove with them and they were going past a, 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 a Soviet POW camp. Now, according to the instruction, uh, Red Cross was not allowed into the camp, into Soviet POW camps. They had no connection with them. However, uh, since the Red Cross rep insisted, the head of the POWs said, okay, you can go visit them. Don't tell anyone I left you. So again, these are anecdotes, but uh, sometimes anecdotes is all we have to, to try to decipher this complex situation. So this is what I used. And we have another, uh, I'm a different qu a question on a different theme from David Newman, who asks, were any, were any Jewish prisoners of war involved in escape attempts? And oh. if so, were they treated differently if they were caught? Uh, Palestinian Jewish prisoners of war were very sought after as companions for escapes. They uh, they knew the language. Some of them knew the the terrain. They they knew the the cities around. They had st they still had relatives. Um, so there was an example of uh, uh, 
the British colonel who, who had to escape and reach the British intelligence. I think it was in Budapest before uh, Germany took over. And uh, there was a, a, a Palestinian Hungarian Jew uh, who I think eventually escaped seven times, six times he was caught, the seventh time he was uh, successful. And he, he was asked to lead this uh, British colonel to the, the uh, British intelligence in Budapest. So uh, yes, they were involved in, uh, in escape, especially the Palestinian Jews. Interestingly, uh, Almogi Kallenboyle, which I mentioned earlier, was, uh, was not really liked by some of the uh, prisoners because he was against escaping. He thought it's a waste of time. Let's just do our time here, wait for the war to end. And then, uh, so, um, but when uh, the, the, the second part of the question about being caught, uh, yes, there was always the, uh, the risk if they, they were caught. Interestingly, the population, usually when they caught prisoners of war in general, they just handed them over to the police. Uh, the police also adhered to the Geneva Convention called the POW camp uh, in the area to hand them over. Uh, it was only when the SS or the Gestapo tried to intervene uh, that, uh, in this, that uh, there was real risk for Jewish POWs. But even in this case, the Jewish POWs insisted, we are protected by the Geneva Convention. We are soldiers, you're not allowed to touch us. You have to send us back to the POW camp. Uh, cases of uh, Jewish POWs being sent to concentration camp after they were captured uh, after an escape attempt and arguing with the commandant, we are soldiers, you have to send us back. And they were sent back to the POW camp because they were protected by the Geneva Convention. Thank you. Jan Ryback. Hi, Thank Jan. you very much. Thank you for this fantastic paper, and I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, could you say something on how these uh, experiences were later commemorated and uh, how this fits into a larger um, memory of um, the Second World War, of the Holocaust, and of the Jewish experience in these uh, years? And yeah. Well, I think as we all know, uh, memoirs are, are not the best thing to, to rely upon. I mean, people, uh, memories change over the years. They let other events uh, impact the, the memories. Some of the Palestinian uh, Jewish POWs who, who became um, really political figures in later years wanted to present their time in captivity as, as, as some sort of a, uh, event that uh, uh, perhaps was more than it really was. Uh, Non-Jewish POWs wanted to, to show uh, how they protected Jewish POWs, so again, perhaps uh, told stories that uh, a little bit exaggerated. So we need to be very careful when we read this, uh, these uh, memoirs, and usually I try to, to uh, cross-reference several memoirs with reports of the Red, uh, the Red Cross for, and reports of the German army in order to get to the bottom of it. I can't say I was always successful. Um, but back to, to your question, how it impacted the, the general, I think the thing is, that the, and obviously the reason I chose to go into this, uh, this topic was that it was under research. So I can't say that uh, there, was, there has been any impact in general of the memoirs or, or the history written about Jewish POWs, uh, that it had an impact on the general uh, history of Jews in the Second World War or of the history of prisoners of war. Um, again, this is the reason I went for this topic in the first place. Hopefully, perhaps it will be different going forward. Thank you, Yora. We are, we are out of time, unfortunately, but before I thank you, um, I'd like to thank everyone um, who has attended today, um, and uh, especially those of you um, who asked um, who asked questions either out loud or in the chat. Um, it, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's really important to, uh, for us to have your, your thoughts and your participation. Um, I'll just mention our next two events at the Birkbeck Institute. 
next Tuesday, the 30th of January, um, we have our in-person Holocaust Memorial Day lecture, which will be given this year by Jane Kaplan from St. Anthony's College in the University of Oxford. And she'll be talking to what's in a name from the final solution to the from the final solution of the Jewish question to the Holocaust. And then the day after that, on the 31st of January, uh, we have another online lunchtime seminar. Uh, we have um, Ken Stern from Bard College. Um, and um, Ken, um, 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 who formerly worked for the um, American Jewish Committee um, and was then one of the authors of the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism before um, resiling really from the way in which it has been applied. Um, so he, he has a story to tell and he will be talking about the conflict over the conflict, the Israel-Palestine debate and the implications for free speech and academic freedom. So that will be on the 31st of January at 1 p.m. But be, 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 before ending, I really do want to extend huge thanks to, to Yorai for a truly fascinating paper, intriguing and rich, but also persuasive, and also for the for the for the very um full and and generous ways in which you um answered um answered questions um i can see from the chat that you have sold a, a number of copies um, um of your book and that's exactly as it should be thank you so much thank you very much